In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, yes, you can just go. Uh, we're happy to have Adel Rafael with us here. Uh, we partner every Monday in the Bible study, uh, 9 to 10 in the chapel or online. Lovely to have uh, you here with us also. Uh, today, Adel is going to speak to us about uh, our faith and the crucified. Our faith and the crucified. And the crucified, the Lord. Um, may God give you worship. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Thank you. I know you are, um, I think you're doing a series now about um, mm -hmm. faith, right? That's what Mariam told me. Um, so I thought about to share with you some ideas tonight about who is that on the cross? And the reason I thought about this is next week, God willing, starting from Sunday night, when you come to church, you're going to see, you walk into the church, you're going to see black flags. Okay? And the mode, like, in sad mode, basically. Right? And you're going to see our Lord, the icons of our Lord, looks like, looks like he is weak. Or he's, that's in his weakness. Okay, and the series will start on Sunday, okay, goes all the way till Friday when he goes on the cross. And some people, they look at him on the cross and say, why? Why all of that? And some people say, is that God? Is that, is that God that you believe in? Is that the creator? Is that the almighty? On the cross, and people beating him, spitting on him. And you know what? You have to give them credit. Like you have to understand where they're coming from. They are absolutely right. I mean, it doesn't make sense. But for us, the believers, should make all kinds of, all kinds of, of sense. And uh, so I'm not going to tell you something new tonight. I just want to go through some ideas about our faith to confirm what we believe in. That's a confirmation. I know you know all of that. But just to make sure that when we go through the passion of the Christ next week, you are comfortable, you are happy, you are satisfied, and you are really enjoying that, that beautiful time of the year. Uh, how can I go to the other one? Okay. Huh? Down. Down. Ah, okay. Yes, yes. So the, the question is, who is that on the cross? The answer that we all know, I'm not going to ask you this, this question because I know you know the answer. The answer, who is that on the cross? Our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the right answer. Our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. But why? Why did he do that? Why he went to the cross? Again, I'm, uh, let me say it again. I'm not saying anything new. The whole, the whole thing started when Adam and Eve sinned in the paradise. Okay? As you know the story, in Genesis chapter 2, God told Adam, or gave Adam a commandment, and told him, from all the trees of the paradise you eat, except one tree. Except one tree. Right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why did God give this commandment to Adam, by the way? This is not the topic. I just, I just want to make sure you follow me here. Why did give Adam this commandment? Why? He told him to eat from every tree except this. Hmm. What if God did not give Adam the commandment? Adam would it, wouldn't have sent that. No problem. But God didn't do that. God gave him a commandment. Why? Any idea? Sorry? For obedience. Yes, yes. God 
did not give the animals. God created Adam, by the way, on the sixth day of the creation. Okay? And you know, a day of the, of the creation in the book of Genesis does not mean 24 hours. It means certain period of time. We don't know how long. Okay? So on the sixth day, God created Adam. And if you follow the creation, and in the, in the first day, God created the light, the dark, day and night, moon and sun, animals, and kept going all the way till Adam. God did not give any part of the, any creation he did. He did not, give, did not give them any commandment except Adam. Adam, he's the only one God gave him the commandment. Because God, if he wouldn't give Adam any commandment, Adam would have been like what? Another animal. Had no choice to make. He had no choice to make. Right? Like any other animal. But God gave him this commandment so Adam can choose. Adam can obey. Adam can make a decision whether to eat or not. Okay? That's the privilege that Adam has or had. So anyway, you know the story. Adam didn't follow the commandment and Eve started by, you know, breaking the commandment. She ate, she gave Adam, Adam ate, and now we have a problem. The problem is that Adam, that God created on his image and God loved so much, Adam now, according to the commandment, must die. Because God told him, if you eat, you will, die. Then Adam must die. Right? And now God had three choices. Right? Three choices. Adam must die so God is judge. God is fair. Right? Or maybe God can forgive Adam. God is a merciful God. But if God would have forgiven Adam, then God is merciful, but not fair, not judge, right? So the first choice, no, not going to work. The second one, no, no. We cannot use fairness with Adam, fairness alone. We cannot use mercy, mercy with Adam alone. Has to be both. So the only solution to this problem is we must find a way to save this creature, Adam. I'm saying all of that to answer the question, why did God, again, I'm sure you know, but it's, again, I'm confirming our beliefs, our ideas to refresh it. So when we go next week, we know what's happening, okay? So the only solution is someone has to save Adam. Who is that can save Adam? The savior, someone has to pay the price has to die for Adam because the, the, the punishment was if you eat, you die. So we need someone to die to save Adam. Who is that can save Adam? We need a savior with the following conditions. I don't know why the, it didn't come here. We need, we need a savior with the following conditions. A, we need someone same nature like Adam, right? I cannot bring an animal and say, this will save Adam, right? If a killer went to the court and in front of the judge and tell him, your honor, your honor, I brought some, I brought some, I brought someone on my behalf, to die on my behalf, so he can set me free. So the, the judge will tell him, what did you bring? If the killer would have, would have brought, brought a cow or a lamb, that's fine. I lost the lyrics. That's fine. Okay. So the, 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 the judge will tell him, no, you cannot bring an animal okay, to redeem you and they set you free. You have to bring someone else like you, a human being. The number one, the savior must be from the same nature like us. Number two, has to be without a sin. I cannot bring a killer to, to save a killer. It has to be, he has to be, no sin. Number three, the, the savior must be someone who is unlimited to take all the sins 
of Adam and his children that Adam will get later on and will all of them they will be born with sins with Adam sins so all these sins from Adam till the end of the days not from today like the world population today for instance 6 billion people 6 billion people are probably more between India and China it's almost 6, 6 billion but if you look at the, the population of the entire globe right now it's over there okay so we need a savior to carry the sins of these people in this generation not only this generation from Adam till the end of the days. So we need an unlimited capacity, unlimited hard drive can can take all of these sins and doesn't crash using the computer language. Then we need a savior with the three criteria or three conditions: a Adam's nature, Adam flesh, b no sin, c unlimited. How can we solve this puzzle? Who can fit this? Can an angel fit this criteria? The angel, no sin, I agree with you 100%. Angels do not sin, cannot sin. They don't have this ability and if they sin, they finish. Like the devil, for instance, used to be an angel. When he sinned, he's done, no mercy. Because his nature cannot, he cannot sin. If he sins, that's by, by pure choice and no mercy here. So an, an angel could solve, could solve the first condition, no sin. What about the same nature like Adam? He's not the same nature. He's, he's from light nature. His, his nature is like light, like spirit, not flesh. So it's not going to fulfill the second condition. And the third condition, the unlimited capacity. The angel is limited. If Archangel Michael appears here now, he cannot be somewhere else at the same time. So the only one, you know, again, you know the answer. The only answer to this problem, the Savior must be God himself. No sin? Yes, check mark. Unlimited? 100%. But about, what about flesh? then God must, must be a man, must became, must become, or take the form of a man. And that's what St. John, in his book, in his gospel, chapter one, that's what he said, in the beginning was the word. Listen carefully here. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Look at the, look at the sequence. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. The word was God. And the word became flesh. The word became flesh. Can we, can we take the word became out and put it changed? What do you think? If we say the word changed to flesh, can we say that? Hmm? We cannot say that. Why? Sorry? First of all, like it's against the nature of God to change. And second of all, what happens to the word then is that the word ceases to exist and then all you have is... Thank you very much. 100%. 100%. We cannot put a change, as Stephen said, because God does not change, then this is not God. And if he changes, is he going to go back? No. So the answer is God, it's every single word is chosen carefully here by the Holy Spirit, okay, who inspired St. John to write the book. The word became flesh, meaning the word took the shape of, is that impossible? No, it is possible. Everything is possible to God. God took the shape of a man without changing his essence. That's why we believe, again, we, 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 we're refreshing our belief here. We believe that his divinity and his humanity always what united. 
he became flesh without losing his divinity. So that person that we see, that we're going to see now, walked on earth, born from the virgin. If you say he's God, you're right. If you see he's, ma he's a man, you are not accurate. I'm not saying you are wrong, but I'm, I'm going to say you are not accurate because he is God and man united. You see a man in front of you, but at the same time, he's, a, he's divine. You see a man, and that's what made people today, for instance, say Jesus Christ was a, a good man, was a prophet. Why don't we call him a prophet? What's wrong with that? By the way, if we if we believe, if we say that Jesus Christ is a prophet, we're going to agree with a huge, huge part of the world, right? We're going to be in peace with, with billions of people. And they say to us, we're doing you a favor because we're saying that who is on that, on the cross, is not God, it's a prophet. Yani, they are doing us a favor by saying that. Okay? What happens if we agree with them? Why, why we insist and we see martyrs? Martyrs die in that belief. A few years ago, we saw over 20 people in Libya got slaughtered because of that belief. If they would have said, we believe that Jesus is a prophet. They would have been with us today. They are with us, by the way, but in the spirit, right? They wouldn't have been killed if they only said that. Why we, we insist no? Why we, he, it has, he has to be God in the flesh. Why? Remember why? Because the third condition on the cross must be who? Must be God. The heresy, Arius, when, we came, when, when he came up with the heresy, and he said, no, the Son, the Son of God, which is Jesus Christ, is less than the Father. Saint Athanasius replied back to him, told him, I'm not going to oppose your heresy because of anything, but if we consider Jesus Christ is not God, then you are affecting my faith, my, my savior, or my redemption, my salvation, then I'm not, I'm not saved. St. Athanasius took it personally. And he told him, if Jesus Christ is not God, then I'm not saved. Then I'm, I'm perished. So Jesus Christ must be God. Now let us take a look at, so we can answer those people. Let's look, take a look at this man that we call him Jesus Christ. Is he really God? Let's see. Now, uh, what am I doing? What am I doing wrong, God? Huh? I found you. What did you do? I, okay, anyway. How do we know that Jesus is God? First of all, he declared that himself Several times. Because sometimes people say, Where, when did Jesus say that I am God? Right? Do you hear that a lot or not? Jesus didn't say, Where in the Bible did Jesus say I am God? We have to, we have to be very um, strong in the Bible. Strong meaning the, the answer has to come from the Bible. You have to just give random answers. Where? Here, John 9. What, what's in John 9? The border blind. What happened at the end of the miracle of the border blind? The Bible says that Jesus heard that they cast him out, which is the border blind. The Pharisees, after they kept questioning him, how, who did that? How he did? How did he do that? And he kept answering. And, and he said, why do you keep asking me the same question again? You want to be his disciples? So they cast him out. Jesus found him. Look, look here. Look, and Jesus answered, asked him and said, do you believe in the Son of God? Jesus is asking the born the blind man. 
do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped. Jesus did very clear declaration saying that I am the son of God. I am God. And it's very strong, by the way. I can tell you that I'm, I'm good in whatever. I'm good in music. But till you see me playing or hearing the way I play my music, you say, this is good. You're really good, right? That is the, the, the strategy or the style of our Lord Jesus Christ in preaching. He let those people that they heard him, he let them say that. It comes from them as a result of all what he's saying and teaching and doing. They said he must be the son. Let's take another example. We all say, we know, we want to know, is that man that he was walking on, on earth, was he God? Or Jesus Christ was a man? We're, we're talking from the Bible. In the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, John what? Hmm. John 11. We have to, we have to remember this chapter. We have to remember. Born the blind only in the gospel according to St. John. John 9. Paralytic. John 5, only St. John. Why I'm saying only? St. John was the last one to write the Bible, to write his book. And he put in most of his writings or miracles, most of them, except one miracle, by the way. All the other miracles that he mentioned was not or were not put in the other books. St. Matthew didn't talk about it. St. Mark didn't talk about it. St. Luke didn't talk about it. Wedding of Cana Galilee. Where do you find it? John 2. What about St. Matthew? No. St. Mark? No. St. Luke? No. Paralytic, that he's been sick for 38 years. Where do you find only St. John? Why? Again, I'm going out to the topic for a few minutes here. I'm sorry, Tante Maria, but tell him to give Bible. Okay. Why, why did St. John mention these miracles? Because St. John wrote his book to focus or to reply for the heresy which doubted the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he wanted to direct his readers that this is God. And if you notice most of his miracles that he mentioned, there is the part of creation. In Wedding of Cana Galilee. What did, what did Jesus do? Water became what? Why? H2O. When you open that tap, you're going to get wine? Right? Right? So you open the tap, you find what? Water. He created... You'll need to unlock your iPad first. Uh, uh, H2O became wine. This is, a, this is creation. And by the way, look at how did our Lord perform that miracle. Did he pray? Didn't ask, didn't say anything. He said, fill the jars with water. So they filled it with water. What happened after that? Give it to the guest. Now you can serve the guest. A simple thing. I wanna, if, if I was one of the waiters in that wedding, okay, and I filled the jar with water, but then I go, to the guest and I put a fine wine. Huh? But that, that's exactly what happened. Creation. So again, this, so that's why St. John mentioned certain kind of miracles to focus on the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Born the blind. Only St. John. John 9. Born the blind. No eyes. No nerves. No retina. So God created the eyes with all its nerves and all its connection to the brain, its creation. That's why he did what? And the memory, thank you, Abun. Okay? 
And that's why he, he, he performed the miracle that's exactly as in the book of Genesis. Spat on the ground, made mud, put the mud on the eyes. Huh? Go to Adam, how God created Adam, you find it the same way. All of that, St. John wanted to, to point, this is God himself that created Adam in Genesis 2. He is the same one he's doing this miracle right now. Here, <clears throat> when Jesus went to raise Lazarus and, and his sister Martha came to him and he told him, if you, have, if you were being here, if you have been here, you wouldn't have died. We told you, we texted you, we told you that he's sick. We sent, we sent the message. You got the text? He said, yes. So why didn't you come? Why you waited four days? She blamed our Lord Jesus Christ. If you, were have, if you have been here, you wouldn't have died. Jesus, our Lord Jesus said, if you believe, he will, he will, he will, raise, he will rise again. Martha replied and said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come in another declaration for some, from someone else. I'm just bringing you a few examples here. St. Peter, when our Lord asked the disciples, who do, say, who do the people say about me? Our Lord with the 12 disciples asked them, who, who this? what do the people think about me? So some said, some they say you are Elijah, some they say you are John the Baptist, some say that you are one of the prophets. St. Peter and, and our Lord said, and what do you say about me? See how, again, the style that he wanted them to say. What do you say about me? St. Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Our Lord Jesus did not reply and did not tell him, Peter, no, you're wrong. Don't say that. But Jesus said and answered him, blessed are you. Jesus praised him. He told him, blessed are you. Yes, Peter, you are right. You are right. Blessed are you. You, you said the right thing. This is a simple formula of the creed. Yes, you are. That's why how, how we start the creed. We believe in our Lord, huh? our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the beginning of the creed. Uh, in one occasion, actually, our Lord declared it himself in front of Caiaphas, the high priest. And he asked him very clearly and told him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Jesus replied and said, I am. I am. I am. All of this proves that he is God. People said it about him and he said it himself. Now, another, another one, St. Thomas, after the resurrection. Thomas said, unless I put my hand where his name and in his, in his side, I'm not going to believe. And our Lord came to him. That's why it's one of the feasts, by the way, that we're going to celebrate one week after the resurrection. It's called the Sunday of Thomas. Okay? Our Lord came to Thomas himself and told him, Bring your hand and put it here. And Thomas did. And put your finger here in my nails. And he did. And after that, St. Thomas said, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. All of this proves that you can reply to those who tell you where in the Bible says that Jesus is God. All of this. Now let's, let's take a look at his miracles. And let's see. Because some people say that prophets, prophets, some prophets did miracles, performed miracles, which is true. Elijah raised the, a child from the dead. Elisha, his disciple, did the same thing. So why not prophets do miracles, right? Even St. Peter in the book of Acts, he raised the girl, Tabitha. St. Paul raised the, 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 the youth guy that he was sitting up there at the window and fell down and, and died. So prophets 
disciples or apostles raised dead people. So maybe Jesus, one of them. Why? Why? Let's see how did our Lord Jesus make or perform his miracles by orders. In the in the miracle of raising uh, the young man of Nia, you know that man that he was the only child for his widow mother. Our Lord Jesus was walking into the village and he saw a funeral, carrying a young man, and he was the only child for his mother. So our Lord Jesus Christ went to the procession of the funeral and stopped it, and put his hand on the coffin and told the young man, rise. See him? Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. Jesus gave him order, arise. Didn't pray, Jesus did not pray, did not do anything, arise. So he was doing the miracle by orders. Any prophet, anyone after that, St. Paul or St. Peter, if you read, they prayed, they prayed. They asked God to raise the person. Here, he, do, he does not ask anyone, but he gives order. Look at his power or his authority on the nature. Okay? He was sleeping in the boat. And the wind, the storm, started to make the sea is very roaring, high waves. The water started to go in the boat and started to be, the, the disciples were in a very dangerous situation. They woke him up. He was sleeping on a pillow, as St. Mark said. He was sleeping in a deep sleep. How, how did he sleep with the storm and the water in the boat? But he was sleeping. So they woke him up. He said, they, say, they told him, Do, don't you care that you're going to perish? And he rebuked them. Why are you afraid? And what did he do? He went in the boat and told the sea and the wind, shh. Even St. Mark put it in a way, in Arabic, he said, Ukkum, yani ikhras, yani shut up. Look at the authority. God is giving orders to the nature. What happened? The Bible says that the wind and the sea obeyed him and became so calm. So this one who performs miracle here cannot be a man or a prophet. He's God. He's God. He gives orders to death, to dead people. He gives orders to, to the nature. Look at this here. We talked about the wedding of Cana Galen. What happened? In the, in the miracle of feeding the multitude, five loaves and two fish, what happened? Fed five, fed 5,000 men. So by counting women and children, we're talking what? We're talking 15 to 20,000 people. Five loaves, two fish. The Bible says that they ate and they were huh? filled. It was an open buffet. Kept eating, eating, eating. Not only that they were okay, satisfied, no, filled. And, how, and 12 baskets remained after that. Our Lord said to each disciple, you carry a basket with you. Carry a basket with you. 12 baskets left. Creation. Five loaves to fish can feed 20,000 or 15,000 people. Maybe you can good enough for one or two people. Right? <clears throat> His teachings. I brought some samples about miracles. Look about his teaching. Again, if someone tell, says that this is man, okay? Look, we looked at his miracle. Let's look, look at his teaching. On the Sermon of the Mount, he said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is a commandment, okay, that Moses gave the Israelites. Okay, 
Look what, what our Lord said here. But I tell you, I tell you, who are you? <laughs> who are you to change the commandment written by God? The Abuna, in, in the fraction, in the divine liturgy, during the Holy Lent, he says what? Fasting and prayer, those that Moses did, so he received what? The commandment written by Ibn Hafid, huh? Finger of God. Finger of God. Yani God wrote this commandment himself. We have someone here says, but I. He didn't change it, by the way. He did not contradict what he wrote before. What did he do here? He elevated. Elevated up. Now you are graduated from grade one or grade two. Now you are going, going to higher, higher level, much, much higher level. You heard that so and so, but I did. Who can do that? Who can do this kind of elevation? It's only him, the writer, the writer himself. And look here, after at the end of the Sermon of the Mountain, it says here in the Gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 7, and so it was when Jesus had ended his sayings. Remember the Sermon of the Mountain, Matthew 5, 6, 7. It's a long sermon. At the end, the people said, the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority. Having one having authority. We can hear to great people give sermons. Pope Shenouda was amazing in his sermons. But Pope Shenouda quoting the Bible, quoting our Lord Jesus Christ, cannot edit or cannot change anything, cannot, cannot only teaching, only explaining. Our Lord here was teaching with an authority. Another thing, reading the thoughts in, in the miracle of the paralyzed man that his four friends brought him down. You know, you know our Lord Jesus was, was teaching in a house and the house was crowded with so many people. And those people, four people came with, with their friend and wanted to bring their friend in front of our Lord. So they broke the roof and they brought their friend in front of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did our Lord say? To the, to the paralyzed man. What did he tell him? The first thing, what he said, what did he say? Your sins are forgiven. Thank you. Your sins are forgiven you. What happened to the people around him? They started to say what, see him? And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. They didn't open their mouth. They did not open their mouth. The reasoning where? In their hearts, their mouth, their lips were sealed. Okay? And the reason is saying what? Why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? Did anyone hear anything? They were saying that where? In their hearts. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, that they reasoned that this within themselves. He said to them, why do you re reason about the things in your hearts? We didn't open our mouth. How did he know? Right? Same thing happened in the house of Simon. This guy, Simon the Pharisee, invited our Lord Jesus Christ for a great dinner at his house. So our Lord went with him. And while our Lord was sitting in, in his house, at his house, a sinner, a woman came to him and started, you know, just so, started to pour fragments on his feet. And, and she kept weeping at his feet. So Simon, Simon here said what? Look here. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, if it's not even, Simon said he's not even a prophet. If he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. 
for she is a sinner. Jesus answered, answered what? He didn't ask any question, Simon. He did, Simon didn't say anything. He said to himself. But the Bible says, Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, and you know, you know what, how our Lord replied back to him. And, and told him, I came to your, your, your house here. You didn't even bring me water to wash my feet. She washed my feet with her tears. You didn't kiss me. Since I entered your house, she didn't stop kissing my feet. Our Lord explained, told him how this woman deserved the forgiveness of her sins. Finally, we saw, we saw that this man cannot be a prophet or a man. It has to be God himself. The way he performed the miracles, the way he taught, the taught his people, the way he was reading the thoughts of everyone. This man is God himself. So what does that mean to me? It means that our Lord Jesus Christ, yes, he came to save you. And as one of the saints said, if, if the life of our Lord Jesus Christ was only one hour on earth, he would have gone to the cross and get this mission done because he came for this. He came to, to be crucified, to die on the cross. Remember why? To pay. Remember the promissory note that he signed, our Lord Jesus Christ signed, save Adam. Now this promissory note, he can what? Well, it's finished. So he came for this purpose. However, our Lord came and lived with us three years or less. Why did he live that long? Why did he serve? He lived, by the way, 33 years. I mean, he, he served for three and a half years. Why, why years? Why he didn't, like when, his, when he was 30 years old, why he didn't go directly to the cross? Because when he came here and lived for this kind of time, okay, and some lit, very little has been mentioned in the books in St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, and St. John. Very little, by the way. St. John, at the end of his book, he said, and so many other things, if we write it about the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't think that the whole world will be enough to contain the books. So what is written is very little. There is nothing. Okay? But anyway, why did our Lord do that? To show us that in him, in him, we have every, every condition or every scenario of life. Our Lord was hungry. So if we feel hungry, he was hungry. He was tired. He slept. He was depressed. Depressed. So if I feel sometimes that I'm depressed, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. He was depressed. He went through all of this pain and suffering. So he knows exactly what we what we go through in our lives. He was tempted the same way we, we tempt we get tempted today. Same exact things. If you are the son of man, food, right? Temptation, glory, pride of life. So if, you, if, if we have any situation, Allah, we can relate, we can relate back to him. He's been there. I can stand up and tell him, you know that, God. You were here with us. You had our flesh. You understand what I'm talking about. I've been dealt unfairly. Those people, they are unfair to me. He will reply back and tell me, I know, Habib. I know. I've been there. People condemned me unfairly. Crucified me, they judged me unfairly. I know that. I know, I feel you. God can feel me because he became like me. The only difference between him and me, what? Thank you. I'm a sinful man. Thank you for reminding me. Right? I'm a sinful man, but him? He's the righteous one. That's the only difference. Other than that, whatever I do, he does. He did it. As I said, he slept, he was hungry, he, 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 uh, he was depressed, he was tempted, all of these situations. And that's why, that's why the Coptic Church, for instance, you find in the Coptic Church, 
Almost every month, there is a feast. Abuna goes and reads the Synexeria and says, today we celebrate the feast of so-and-so. Why? Why are we celebrating, for instance, we're going to celebrate this Sunday, a feast. One of the feasts of the Lord, the entry of our Lord Jesus Christ to Jerusalem. So, Palm Sunday. Why are we doing that? Why? Why the church has so many celebrations and feasts, almost every event of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ? Look at this. I'll show you. We celebrate the Annunciation. It's the Feast of the Annunciation, the Feast of the Nativity, the Feast of Theophany, the Feast of Palm Sunday, the Feast of Resurrection, the Feast of Ascension, the Feast of the Pentecost. Look how many feasts. And the Feast of the Circumcision of our Lord, the Feast of the Lord Jesus entering the, the temple, the Feast when they fled to Egypt. What's happening here? Why all of these feasts? Because every single event here it's for me. In the resurrection, in the resurrection, it is my resurrection. You think we're celebrating something happened 2,000 years ago when our, when our Lord rose from the dead? No. No, I'm celebrating my resurrection. When he rose from the dead, that means I will rise again. He took my flesh, so this flesh will rise again. If you go back, now we take it for granted, we take it for granted that next week we're going to celebrate our resurrection. Okay? We're going to have a nice meal and everything. But if you go back before the time of our Lord Jesus Christ and you say that we're going to rise again, okay? even to Abraham, even to Abraham, that we say today, Abraham is what? In the funeral, Abuna prays and says what? Repose, you will. God, he's praying to the, to the dead person and say to God, repose his soul where? In the bosom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, before the incarnation of Christ, you ask them, like oh, when Christ will come, will save us, we rise again, but so far we are dead. We are dead. That's why we're celebrating those feasts. Every single feast for me. The Annunciation is coming. The Nativity is, is born. Entering, entering the Jerusalem. Then he will enter my life. He can clean everything in my heart and in, in my life. Every single feast. That's why the church putting this many feasts during the year. Not only that, on the 29th day of every Coptic month, every Coptic month, the church came up with a feast as if we need another feast. What? We celebrate three feasts of that day. Annunciation, Nativity, Resurrection. Every single month. Why? Because this means a lot to me. He's coming as God in the flesh. He saved me. This is a celebration that we should take every single day. Glory be to God forever and ever. Thank you. This of the report. Um, maybe this is a bit. I take. I don't take questions. I don't take. No, I don't take questions. Why you don't take questions? I don't take questions. I'll pay you more. Can we turn on the light? Yeah, I I think that sometimes um. People get confused about when St. Paul says in the Bible, uh, he bore our sins, or actually no, St. Peter says he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Or in the scripture when it says he became sin. Uh, and, uh, and what that means. And like, do we understand that like our sins like transferred onto him? Or does it mean like, in the Old Testament, where they would sacrifice and the animal would be killed, you have to sin. So, does it mean his death, the 